Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be, and welcome to my post on Isaac Newton. It's called Chronology. Isaac Newton was a grade A crackpot about most things. He loved alchemy, biblical numerology, rebellious theology. If he were alive today, he would probably be disappointed that we haven't found the reason for all of the numerological and chronolog chronological patterns he saw in nature. Based on his occult studies, he thought that Charlemagne in 800 AD marked a biblical turning point which predicted the fiery volcanic fall of Rome in 2016 or 2034, or 2060. He wasn't entirely sure, because he'd been poisoned with mercury, and it made him a little bit loony. But he was quite certain that at some point there would be a cataclysm, lasting about three and a half years. Today, we know that even though volcanoes like Campi Flegri do seem to become more or less active on a cyclical basis. No volcanologist would suggest that this statistical pattern can be used to predict the behavior of any individual volcano. Nevertheless, there is something to the study of chronology. If we see defined patterns in nature, why shouldn't we be able to see defined patterns in time? Isaac Asimov was a champion or satirist of such a chronological idea in his fiction, and he called this concept psychohistory, the idea that the characters of different generations will cycle through in a repetitive fashion in correspondence with the economic and cultural climate. The idea that the temperaments of individuals follows a temporal pattern which can be read in the stars comes, of course, from astrology. And if Newton were alive today, he might be surprised by the ways in which astrology has been replaced by psychology, a discipline predicated on the notion that personalities are exclusively shaped by random, uncontrollable formative events. Then again, if you combine Asimov's psychohistory with Jungian psychology, the result is quite similar to astrology. I wrote a post on Jungian psychology, and I find it interesting that in correspondence with astrology, science tells us that babies war born in winter are at the greatest risk for schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, with a peak in January. Meanwhile, spring babies appear to be at a greater risk for depression, with a peak in May. So I think that while astrology definitely oversells its capability of finding patterns in people. Science oversells a lot of its results as well. <laughs> so what I'd like to, my takeaway is that pseudoscience is very widespread, but it's hard to identify even within things that look scientific. Astrology and psychology only tell us about statistical trends within individuals, but economics tells us about productivity trends within populations. And these trends have been modeled by both modern and ancient civilizations. Similar to the 30-year Konradiev wave of Austrian economics, 
the Chinese calendar has cycles of 60 years, corresponding to changes in agricultural productivity and war. In every system of economic chronology, there are short cycles and longer term cycles. This year of 2019 is the year of the pig. Well, now it's 2020, but... So I guess it's the year of the rat now. What I notice is that all of these systems divide time up with 30 degree angles, similar to the Poincaré disk model of projective geometry, similar to the clock on your wall, and similar see, in physics, the Poincaré disk model provides the geometric brush strokes with which we paint the picture of the subatomic realm and the cosmic realm of the solar system. I believe that Newton would see the 30 degree Weinberg angle of standard model particle physics and recognize its analog within his planetary model of a clockwork universe. Today, scientists speak of the Big Bang universe, exploding, unpredictable, out of control, and completely random. This is in stark contrast with the ordered world imagined by Newton and others of his time. If Newton were alive today, he would be drawn to the numerology of Dirac and Rayo regarding the gravitational constant and the number of charged particles in the universe. They noticed that the ratio of the radius of the universe to the radius of the electron was the same as the radius of the gravitational and electrical forces between a proton and an electron. It was a strange coincidence that suggested a recursive, self-similar, clockwork-like organization of the universe, rather than explosive randomness. Of course, the truth is somewhere in between these two extremes. Perhaps such debates seem silly, but how we view the cosmos has profound psychological impact on how we view our own lives and communities. If the Earth is destined to be eaten by the sun and the universe is destined to die a long, slow heat death, people feel small, weak, and insignificant. But if the universe is in a steady state, fed with vibrational energy from a godlike force, then there is hope that we have been created for something more than just reproduction and death. If the universe is eternal, existing at the will of God, then we are here at his will. We are here for a purpose. This belief is encouraging and community building. It also causes people to fight over what God's will is, but it inspires the creation of music, life, community, and art, all of the things that make life worth living. After spending decades immersed in the atheism of big science labs, my heart grew kind of sick and tired, and I started to understand Newton's theological perspective more clearly. Newton believed that gravity was a spiritual force and dis disapproved of Descartes' idea that the planetary motion was caused by vortices made up of small particles filling all of space, as in a Dirac sea. This was why, although he knew that combining the outward push from rotational motion with a 1 over r cubed inward pressure from ether-filled space, will give the 1 over r squared gravitational force law. He preferred not to explain things in that language because he wanted people to remember that God was the force behind everything. 
not some uninspiring fluid dynamic convection principle. Like Lenz's law, nature hates a change in flux. Newton most certainly wouldn't have been impressed by the conflation of space and time by a very confused young man named Einstein, who got lost in a curved coordinate system taught to him by his professor, Minkowski. Newton would have been surprised that this confused young man was given so much acclaim for bringing his corpuscular theory of light back into fashion. He would then look at quantum mechanics and the methods used to transmogrify metals and be disappointed that so little progress had been made towards finding the philosopher's stone. Is uranium the philosopher's stone? He never would have thought that to make gold from lead, one must fire nuclear particles with an accelerator gun. Newton believed that metals possessed a life force because of how a dendritic amalgam of crystallized silver would form when mercury was added to silver nitrate. Today, we would call the creation of that little silver tree a negative entropy system. Since life is itself a negative entropy system, Newton's choice of syntax may sound strange to a modern ear, but in its root meaning, it is not far off from our modern understanding. Newton would probably be happy to see how much cultural progress we've made in science because back in his day, royalty had made many forms of alchemy punishable by death because they were afraid that the alchemists would figure out how to transmogrify cheaper elements into gold thereby devaluing their store of wealth and destabilizing the economy. I don't think that Bitcoin qualifies as alchemy or as the philosopher's stone, but I could be wrong. It is sort of like digital alchemy. When resources are abundant, people, money, and thoughts move quickly increasing the noise in our communities and minds. Noise drowns out the music of truth. And when no one can access the truth, certain ideas die as they attempt to squeeze through an intellectual bottleneck, like the sands of time. As humanity accelerates towards yet another bottleneck, Newton's ideas still ride in the center of the stream, and that is why I have hope for a bright future in which the horrors of the past century are not repeated. Those horrors were expressed nicely by Yeats' poem, The Second Coming. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of Spiritus Mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in the sands of the desert, a shape with a lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun, is moving its slow thighs while all about it, real shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again, but now I know that twenty centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle, and what rough beast its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. What I know is that intellectual bottlenecks caused by chaos, pressure in the system, 
happen over and over again. And each time humanity has come through stronger and better in many ways. We are taught about the universal truth of positive entropy and the heat death of the universe today. But when there is an outside energy source powering gravity and atoms, negative entropy rules, life flourishes, and greater order emerges in an ebb and flow. This is also a universal truth. Order is destroyed on one length scale, only to re-emerge on another. Today, the world is in a war which is virtually invisible to those who are dying on the front lines. It is fought with toxic, addictive substances that kill slowly but surely, poisoning the minds and bodies of the enemy. When a country is losing such a war, it isn't even aware of it because it is too befuddled to notice. Yet in a world of limited resources, someone has to lose sometimes. And when a nation gets sick from the products it produces or it consumes, this is possibly the kindest result one could hope for. One has, no one today has a stomach for the brutality of past wars. Today, people die quietly in their own homes of liver disease, autoimmune disease, dementia, or diabetes, while their children disconnect from the world and get lost on an internet full of doom and gloom. I suppose I'm not helping there. <laughs> it is my hope that those children will find books and blogs that help them put what they see in perspective and come to terms with the happiness and sadness in the world today. An understanding of balance, that there are two truths, not just one. It is raining very hard outside of my window today and sometimes it feels like the world is crying or smiling along with me. If you also feel like crying or laughing with me, I encourage you to try reading my novels. They are a little bit loony, but they spread their arms wide, embracing both sadness and happiness. I think this gives a sense of fullness and kindness to life. There's no reason to be afraid. Life has always been like this. Thank you for watching. Um, please tune in for my next posts.